started walking my childhood day. Hi, my name's Leo and I'm a boat builder and a sailor and I'm on a mission to rebuild and restore the 110 year old classic sailing yacht Tally Ho. Right now I am not working on the boat, I am back in the UK taking a break and renewing my visa. So there's going to be no work on the boat in this video but I'm going to be answering some of the questions that you guys have asked on Facebook and Instagram. And hopefully, although it may not be as exciting as our normal episodes, uh, it might be interesting to get some more insight on the things that I normally don't have time to talk about. All right, so let's get to it. Uh, I'm gonna be looking at these questions and the first one I've got here is a question from Darren Bent, asked on Instagram and 143 people liked this question, meaning that it was quite popular. And the question is, will you be building the little boat on the deck as well? So the little boat on deck is known as a tender and most boats have a tender of some kind uh, as a means of getting on and off the boat when the boat's not tied alongside a pontoon. Exceptions to that might be boats that are small enough to be beached themselves or racing yachts where they would leave their tenders behind to save weight. I do actually have the drawings for the original tender they're drawn by Albert Strange, so I've got the lines and I could build a replica, and yes, I would love to do that. It was a 14-foot motor dinghy and it had an inboard engine, probably paraffin or something at the time, and I hope to build a replica, uh, but I just don't know when that will be. It may be that when I've finished Tally Ho, I'll be so desperate to go sailing uh, that I postpone building the tender uh, to a later date and may use something else in the meantime, but at some point I definitely intend to to build it I do know that some of my previous volunteers were talking about building the tender in the UK uh, While I get on with Tally Ho, but I haven't heard anything about that yet, but who knows now? I've had a few questions about the internal layout of the boat. So there's one here What's the internal layout going to be? Is there decent headroom in the saloon? So I do have the drawings for the original layout um, and at the moment I am hoping to follow them fairly closely. In some ways I'd really like to modernise it in terms of the layout. Modern boats often have a galley which is part of the saloon, so that means the kitchen sort of being in the living area of the boat uh, and, and that is a more modern sort of approach rather than in the earlier boats you would have the galley sort of away from the saloon because you'd have paid crew doing the cooking and you wouldn't want them mixing with the posh guests. So tally is like that, the, the galley and the crew quarters are sort of forward and then the saloon is a bit separate which is quite dated really for a boat these days. So I'm not quite sure how I'll do that, I might maybe just leave some partitions out so it's a bit more open plan. I might shift a couple of things a little bit just to sort of try and maximize the, the efficiency and space a little bit more for a boat that's gonna be lived on full time. But I am hoping to broadly speaking, follow the layout and in terms of the, the woodwork and the construction and the furnishing and the design, I, I plan to try and follow that as exactly as is practical really. So here's another good question. Uh, and again, there's a few different uh, iterations of this same question asked by Nick Sullivan and it was like 257 times on Instagram. The question is, it's a long way off, but what's the first voyage after sea trials? Now, I can't answer this question with a definitive answer because the truth is, who knows what might happen and what might change. But at the moment, I, I imagine, you know, the first few months or maybe the first season will be spent sort of doing sea trials and maybe going on a few longer trips around the area probably to the San Juan Islands and Puget Sound and then the first long voyage really is going to be the voyage back to the UK and that's going to be a very long voyage it's going to take a long time and I don't know yet which way I'm going to go so there's four options really or the, the four most obvious options uh, there's the Panama Canal um, to get from the Pacific to the Atlantic and then sort of up Northern Atlantic back to the UK. Um, there's going south around Cape Horn, south of Chile, and then up through the South Atlantic. Uh, that's a pretty long way round. Um, there's the Northwest Passage, which is going over the top of Canada, 
through the Arctic Circle and coming out um, between Greenland and the east coast of Canada and then crossing the North Atlantic from there. And that would probably be the shortest route from, from where I am. Um, or there's the long way around going right across the Pacific and then um, either going through the Suez Canal or around the Cape of Good Hope south of South Africa. Now, I haven't decided on any one of these, although I would quite like to rule out the Panama Canal uh, because it just kind of seems like the most boring of the four options, really. And also, the Panama Canal wasn't actually um, built when Tally Ho was launched, so it seems like a good excuse to go a more interesting route. At the moment, the two routes which appeal to me the most uh, would be either going around Cape Horn. I think that would be really, really exciting and interesting. The other thing which appeals to me is the Northwest Passage going north over the top of Canada. And again, I think um, high latitude sailing is really exciting and it would be amazing to, to follow the footsteps of the early, early sort of adventurers and voyagers who, who first discovered that passage, although they were going the other way. One of the downsides with that route would be that um, I would miss out on cruising in the Pacific and um, sort of starting in the Pacific, it seems a shame not to see any of it. But maybe I could do a Pacific cruise and then the Northwest Passage. Here's another question from Gub 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 Could a dolphin, if properly trained, operate your forklift? And um, to answer that question, I'm not sure I'm qualified, but my feeling is that if the forklift was submersed in water and yet somehow engineered to still run, I do think a forklift trained dolphin could probably operate it quite well. So thanks for that question. Uh, let's move on. Douglas Owens asks on Instagram, um, all through the restoration I've stated that freshwater ingress uh, is a bad thing. Why is freshwater bad and what's the difference between that and salt water? Um, which is a question that might seem obvious to those of us who have spent a lot of time on wooden boats. Um, but to someone who, who hasn't, or hasn't spent much time uh, on the sea in general, uh, it might not be obvious at all. I'm going to generalise a little bit here, but most rot and fungus are living organisms that need fresh water and oxygen to live. And so the reason that those things can't grow in salt water is the same reason really that a human being um, can't survive on a desert island in the middle of the sea without fresh water, because salt water won't support that type of life. Now it's widely believed that salt water actually kind of pickles wood, and I'm not an expert on how that happens, but um, you can see if you, if you take driftwood off the beach that's been in salt water for a long time, uh, it's, it's never rotten, it's usually quite hard, and although the edges will have been worn away by waves and a shingle and so on, uh, the wood itself is usually very sound, and that's sort of been pickled by salt water. Ships that operate on lakes used to get big chunks of salt and literally put them in the bottom of the boat so that the water inside the boat, the fresh water, would become salt water. And I think even at sea, some boats used to do that. Salt water is a, is a very, very hostile environment for, for most things, um, certainly for most metals, um, for most materials. And so wood is really quite unusual in that it actually enjoys being in salt water. The fiberglass boats, you, you want to take them out of the water fairly often, let them dry out, stop them from getting osmosis. Steel boats, are, obviously they, they're going to rust, so you have to uh, be very careful with how you coat them and make sure they're coated extremely well. So really there's very few materials which are stable in salt water, um, but wood is one of them. The wood actually wants to be in the salt water and it's usually taking it out of that salt water uh, either letting it dry out or putting it in fresh water that does the damage. Obviously, even if a wooden boat is in the sea, um, there's going to be fresh water coming from any rain, and that is what usually causes deterioration of wooden boats, 
it causes rot when the rainwater gets in between the deck planks or anywhere in the hatches or get inside the boat and if there's places where that water can sit um, and there's also oxygen then that's a place where rot is very likely to start. Bruce Evanson says on Facebook and this comment got 79 likes says I am impressed with the sharpness of your tools how and how often do you sharpen them and what with? So I've used a lot of different sharpening techniques. Last year actually I was lucky enough to get a Tormek, which is a Swedish made machine. It's a sharpening system that uses a slow rotation diamond stone wheel uh, with water bath. And it has a system of very well thought out jigs, which helps let you get an uh, accurate and repeatable sharp edge on your tools. Now, this is not an advert for them, but it is a very good machine uh, and I do recommend it. However, it's pretty expensive. And for years I was sharpening my tools uh, in, in a more traditional way. Generally I would use a regular grindstone to make a hollow and then I'd use a diamond stone uh, sometimes with a honing jig or sometimes uh, just by eye to um, put the, the final honing edge on it. Honing jig is useful because you can repeat the same angle um, many times. And with any of these sharpening methods um, one really important thing which sometimes is neglected is getting a really, really flat back to the blade. And then it's a lot easier to put a nice edge on the top side of the blade and, and get it razor sharp. I also really highly recommend using leather strops or a leather wheel to uh, hone a blade. It can make a really big difference and take a fairly sharp blade to real razor sharpness. But um, I haven't got the tools here to show you what I'm talking about, so I'm not gonna talk anymore, but we might cover that more uh, another time. Barry Harmsworth on Facebook asks if I'm going to stick with a tiller rather than using a wheel to steer the boat. He's pointed out that with a heavy displacement boat like this it could be very heavy work indeed to steer it using just a tiller. But the answer is yes, I am going to stick to the original uh, design in, in having a tiller to steer the boat. I've sailed a lot of traditional old working boats which, which are tiller steered, uh, some, some of them are very big and it can be hard work but if it's too hard there's ways around it so you could use a block and tackle or something like that for example to, to get some purchase and pull the tiller. Usually when it's really hard work uh, you'll be close hauled and there'll be a lot of weather helm so you'll be pulling the tiller just one way often. The other thing about using a tiller is that you're actually a lot more in touch with the, the the boat itself you can really feel what it's trying to do a lot more and so for example if a boat is unbalanced you may not even notice with a wheel that your the boat's unbalanced and you're constantly having to steer her upwind or downwind you'll have a weather helm or lee helm and you won't know about it and you'll actually be slowing the boat down because the tiller um, will be offset from the center line creating more turbulence underwater whereas with a tiller you're going to know about it because it's going to be really pulling your arm trying to straighten out because all that extra force that you're, you're creating under the water, you're feeling it in your arm. And so that's a good incentive to try and balance the boat better. And if you're getting that, you know you've probably got to change your sail trim, uh, balance the boat more, and then she should ride um, nice and easy and not take too much effort to steer. That also depends a lot on the design of the boat, of course. It also depends on your point of sail and all sorts of other things, but hopefully uh, it will be manageable with a tiller. Joe Smith says, when will you admit that the whole thing is filmed on a green screen and Checker is played by a series of actresses? Ola Tedin on Facebook says, will you enter the fast net race once she's finished? And yes, the plan is definitely to race Tally Ho again in the fast net, uh, if at all possible, which it should be. And I'm going to be aiming for either the centenary of the first ever fast net, uh, which will be 2025, or the centenary of the year that Tally Ho won the fast net, which will be 2027, or maybe both of them. But it's definitely on the cards. Zachary Guzan on Facebook says, do you have any recommendations for those of us who are interested in building or sailing wooden boats? or sailing in general, but have no clue how to go about getting started. Um, well, I do. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this in too much depth because it could take a while, but I've actually written a little FAQ and it's gonna be on my website, um, hopefully by the time this video is up. 
and one of the questions, well two of the questions are how to get into sailing and how to get into boat building without any experience. So head over and have a read of that. The short summary is put yourself in the right position where you'll meet people who can, who can take you out sailing. With sailing I recommend starting small, the smaller the better really, so I encourage people to uh, go to dinghy sailing clubs, uh, learn to sail dinghies, they're often quite affordable to join these clubs and they often offer tuition as well. And alternatively go to marinas and just look for people on their boats and maybe offer to help. Uh, you see someone washing their boat, offer to help them wash down, help them tidy up, give them a hand fixing whatever they're doing. Just offer your help and say that you're trying to get some accruing experience and is there any chance you can go out with them. Um, if you go out and you show willing and you work hard and you listen and you ask questions when you're not sure and you're you know the first to to, to help clean the boat and um, put things away and generally willing and able then you'll be invited back and before you know it you'll be um, crossing oceans uh, with with friends you've made so that's how I'd recommend with boat building uh, it's a bit different but I think it depends a bit more on your experience whether it would be better to go for a course to start with, maybe if you haven't got any tool skills already, or if you've got a bit of trade experience, then I would probably recommend um, trying to go straight into an sort of unpaid apprenticeship position in a boatyard. And again, the best way to get into that is just word of mouth. So probably physically going to boatyards and talking to people uh, would be what I would recommend. Peter Green on Facebook says, are you going to keep everything traditional and simple or will you have electronics, generators, wood makers, autopilots, etc.? Well, that's a good question um, and it's not something I've fully decided on yet. Um, there's going to be some more modern systems than on my previous boat, for example, where there was really nothing. By that I mean I'm probably going to have a working toilet. Um, I know I'm going to have a diesel engine and a few other things, but I am going to keep it fairly basic, I think. It's likely that I'll charge batteries off the, the main engine using an alternator. It's quite likely that I'll have an autopilot, uh, which will be a way of having the boat steer itself. And previously I've used wind vanes for that. With Tallyho it would be difficult to use a wind vane because the boom overhangs the stern so far. Um, but it might be possible, if not, there'll be some kind of electronic autopilot, I think. Um, and that's really so that I can sail the boat single-handed or at least move it round single-handed if I need to. My previous boat didn't have GPS and I, I sailed without GPS. It might change, but right now my feeling is that I want to do the same thing on Tally Ho. I, I would like to not have any GPS on board at all and be reliant on traditional navigation. And that's because I found navigating traditionally was such a joy and doing it in earnest, that is knowing that I didn't have the backup of a GPS hidden somewhere on board, uh, really gave me a much greater sense of satisfaction, uh, especially on arrival uh, at, at the place where I was trying to go to, or sometimes the place well, I wasn't trying to go to, but <laughs> it's, it's a really amazing feeling to navigate by the stars, the sun, the moon, and the things you can see, and it totally changes the way that you sail, I found. It, it changed my perception of distances, it made me think a lot more, made me plan ahead and sail in a much safer way in some respects. So I, I do really like the idea of uh, not having any modern navigational equipment on Tally Ho, but we'll see what happens. Following those same lines, Russ Wetzel says, would you consider a post-launch tracking device to allow us to follow you and follow the story? And I'm afraid the answer is no way. Um, for me, being at sea is um, a meditative and deep experience and I think it would be ruined by uh, knowing that there's people sort of following your move and wondering why you're doing four knots instead of six knots or where you're going. Um, I like to have no communications when I'm out at sea. Uh, I, I carry a VHF radio, but that only has a 
pretty limited range and of course an EPUB for emergencies but uh, I don't like the idea of being connected to the internet while while sailing and I don't really like the idea of people being able to know exactly where I am. Now this does link into another question which is what are you going to do with the boat when she's finished and will you keep making videos when you're sailing the boat? And the answer is that I would like to keep making videos. Um, I'd love to sort of develop the channel from boat building into sailing skills, sort of traditional rope skills, maintenance. I mean, there's all sorts of things, um, rigging, navigation, there's sort of a, a world of stuff that could be explored and taught. Um, and also sort of following the adventures of the boat wherever she ends up. So I do hope to keep making videos. And what am I gonna do with her? Well, essentially sail her. Um, and that's what she was built for. Um, she can more or less go anywhere and I want to take her to some interesting and extreme places. I certainly have no plans to sail the boat, uh, certainly for a long time. At the moment, I'm not quite sure about chartering the boat, if that's something I'll consider or not but I would really like to sort of do something positive with it in general. And I'm not sure exactly what that would be, but perhaps taking kids out on trips, maybe kids that would never normally get a chance to do something like that. Perhaps uh, taking food or resources to places where they're needed. I, I like the idea really of being able to adventure with the boat and sort of do positive rewarding and community orientated things along the way where they come up and where it's possible and helpful to do them um, without being necessarily sort of locked into into one role or another but we'll see that's a it's a long way away philip philipski on instagram says how high is the headroom inside for now it seems like you can barely fit <laughs> um, well actually the the beams that run across the boat at the moment from one side to the other, that they're, they're not at deck level. They're a bit lower, quite a bit lower than the deck. They're on one of the water lines. So the deck beams are gonna be quite a bit higher than that. And there should be standing headroom in some, probably not all of the boat. Um, but hopefully in the saloon area, there'll be, uh, well, ideally about six foot of headroom, which is how high I am. Um, and that may be one of the modifications I make from the original. I may lower the sole board slightly. Sole boards are what you stand on. I may lower them slightly to, to allow myself to be able to stand up straight. Uh, Charles on Instagram says, which nation's coin will go on the mast step? Which is an interesting question. Now, of course, she'll be a UK registered vessel. Uh, that's where she was originally built and she'll be registered there. So she'll fly the British ensign. Um, but seeing as she has now got such a, a huge part of her history, modern history, connected with the US. Um, seems to me fitting that perhaps a, a US coin under the mast step would, would be a, a nice way to, to honor that sort of part of her. Daft Sprite on Instagram asks, is mastering shipcraft worth it? Tell us about the fruits of your trade, if I may ask. Well, the short answer I'm gonna say is yes. <laughs> Um, but it, it really does depend on on your your goals, I suppose, and and what you want to achieve. Um, I wouldn't recommend necessarily uh, getting into wooden boat building um, or traditional sailing if uh, money is is your motivation. It's not always the best way to make money. However, um, you can make a fairly comfortable living, and the other benefits I think far outweigh that. There's something very deep and meaningful, I think, about uh, working with your hands, um, whether that's building something or, or being active, sailing a boat or any other activity. For me, it's, it's manifested as boat building and sailing. It could be something completely different. Something about the adventurism of sailing, which is linked with the, the history of it as well. So it, so it's got this very strong connection with, with the explorers that uh, we're all sort of descended from. Something about that on the one hand, and then the, the physicality and the realness of it on the other hand, um, where you actually, 
you, you have to do things with your own hands just in order to survive, you know, in order to build your boat, in order to maintain it, and in, in order to navigate and sail it, you've got to be very active and you're, you're very close with your own mortality, I guess, especially when you're sailing a boat you know, on your own with little equipment. I'm not saying it's inherently dangerous all the time, but you are completely in charge of your own destiny and your own mortality. Um, don't mean to be melodramatic about it, but you know, like, like when you're standing at the edge of a tall building or something, you have that feeling of sort of fear and excitement really. You know you're in control, like if you chose to you could, you could be gone forever. On a boat it's kind of like that all the time. You, you, you make a wrong move or you don't think about it, you know, you, that's it, it could be over. And even when building a boat, you have to recognize that if you don't do your job properly, then this thing isn't going to be able to, to look after you and it might fall apart mid-ocean and again uh, that could be it. For me that sense of closeness to reality and mortality makes you feel really alive, makes you feel confident, makes you feel uh, like you can, you can survive, you can look after yourself. Um, it, it gives me great, great joy to both to build boats and to sail them. So I certainly think that it's worth the effort. And that's probably all we got time for. Uh, I can see that the sun is about to be in my eyes and I've been talking for uh, quite a while. So there's many questions I haven't answered, but thanks everyone for, for asking questions. Um, I haven't really talked about the, all the amazing people that have made this project possible. Um, and there's, there's stories to be told there and, and many people to be thanked. Um, but that'll have to wait till the next time I do one of these. And if you guys like it, then we'll, we will do another one. So for now, uh, thanks a lot for watching and a massive thank you to everyone who's donated or otherwise supported the Tally Ho project. It does make a huge difference and it means I'm able to take the time to make and edit these videos. So I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys next time. Cheers. Out on a hill